So in the last section of this lecture, we talked about um, how we can study false confession using field studies. Aside from those field studies, psychologists have also studied confessions in more controlled lab studies. Uh, one paradigm that researchers have used to study confession and interrogation techniques in the lab is that is the alt-key paradigm, which was developed by Kassin and Keichel in 1996. Uh, in the alt-key paradigm studies, participants believe they are participating in a reaction time task where they have to type letters or words. Uh, so the experimenter will read these letters or words to them and they have to, they have to type them as at, the, at that pace. Participants might be placed in the slower fast paced condition task and they're told not to touch the alt key. Um, that touching the alt key would result in damage to the computer and loss of data. This of course isn't true, but it's emphasized to participants that, this, that the computer would essentially break and they would be responsible. So then the computer appears to break and the experimenter asks the participant if they did hit the alt key and when they deny that they did hit the alt key, uh, the experimenter asks the confederate if they saw anything. The confederate who was thought to also be a participant claims that they either did see the participant hit the key or that they saw nothing. Um, so they're varying this condition in which maybe you would have an eyewitness to a crime. And then they vary, ver they vary the interrogation techniques they use, which I'll get into a little bit more detail in later slides. But the, over the overarching idea behind the alt-key paradigm that's used in many studies um, is that college students are put in this fast pace, faster slow pace reaction time task. The they're accused of damaging the computer, and even though none of them hit the alt-key, um, and then using various interrogation techniques they see what the rate of confession is how many how many participants will say that they did hit the alt key um, despite them all being innocent to go over the findings of the original alt key paradigm study um, so what Kassin and Keuchel did was they manipulated the speed of the task fast versus slow and the eyewitness um, the purpose of increasing the speed was to make it more plausible that they may have accidentally hit the alt key and then the fast paced task also feels more stressful than the slow paced task. Um, participants that are in the fast paced group are more likely, were more likely to sign a confession despite their innocence. Um, they were also more likely to internalize their guilt and confabulate details. Internalizing guilt and this confabulation of details were measured by leaving the participant alone with the confederate who asked what happened uh, after they had been interrogated. So the experimenter asks, you know, accuses them of hitting the alt key and then they're left alone with this other person who they think is another, just another student. Um, and the confederate asks what happened and they might say, if they internalize their guilt, they'll say, oh, I, I guess I accidentally hit the alt key. Uh, some participants even said that they that they came up with details about how they hit it. Oh, I was, you know, I had to hit this key and I just, I just remember accidentally hitting it with this finger or whatever. Um, but they came up with details that just didn't exist because they didn't hit the alt key. Uh, overall, it's what they found was that 69% of participants confessed uh, more more than a quarter internalized their confession by believing that they must have hit the key on accident so internalizing this guilt and then surprisingly 9% told the confederate details about how they hit the button um, specifically though those in the fast paced group were much more likely to confabulate details such that 35% told the confederate details about hitting the button compared to the 9% the slow condition. So just being in the fast paced condition um, increased the risk of confabulating details to the crime or maybe more so internalizing this guilt.
The alt key study, although is a good is a good measure of some um, interrogation techniques, the a newer um, paradigm has been developed that isn't as limited. So the alt key paradigm is limited because it does not require intention to commit wrongdoing. Uh, so Kassin, Rosano, Meissner, and Narchet performed follow-up research that involved an intentional act. Subjects were given this logic problem that they had to solve, and they were paired with a confederate in a room. Then they're told that they were prohibited from helping each other, so you can't you can't work with the confederate, um, but you're just in this room together. The confederate in one group elicited help uh, and all the participants were interrogated by the experimenter using aspects of the read method such as positive confrontation. Uh, if you remember positive confrontation you're just uh, I know you did it, we know you did it, stop denying it. Um, but the three variables that they manipulated in this 2005 study was guilty versus innocent so using the confederate if the participant did help the Confederate, then they were guilty. Um, they cheated on the task, but if they didn't, then they were innocent. So they could manipulate whether they were guilty or not. Um, they also varied other methods um, or other variables as well, such as minimization versus no minimization. Minimization is uh, trying is a method in which you minimize the seri seriousness of the offense and the perceived consequences of confession. So if you remember from the read technique, one thing that interrogators might do is say, well, you didn't, you know, you didn't really mean to, or you did this be for this m moral reason and not because you're a complete jerk. Um, so they're minimizing the seriousness of the offense. It's not a big deal. Um, and then they also manipulated leniency offers. So in the deal condition where they gave a leniency deal or offer, um, participants were told that the problem could be settled pretty quickly if they just signed the statement, but give it, then they were given the impression that they would receive harsh punishment if they failed to do so. So results from the Rosano and colleagues study uh, demonstrated that interrogation alone led to more true confessions and few false confessions. Additionally, by minimizing the seriousness of the crime, true confessions and false confessions increased. So nearly half of participants falsely confessed when they were offered a deal and the interrogator used minimization techniques. If the goal, if your goal here is to have minimal false confessions, then the interrogation only condition is best, um, where you see only 6% uh, people falsely confess to cheating on the logic quiz and then uh, but if your goal is to get as many guilty people to confess as possible then you should use minimization tactics and offer some sort of deal to the suspect um, again it just really depends on what the goal is so in the United States uh, our our laws are set up essentially or our court system is set up in hopes of having fewer people uh, serve time for things that they didn't commit, even if it means having more people uh, who are guilty falsely released. So we, in our court system, uh, it would be better if we just ha if we had the interrogation only, uh, just to minimize the number of people who falsely confess. Moving away from studies specifically and how we can test false confessions in the lab, uh, there there's ton of tons of evidence out there about false confessions and what might induce a false confession. Um, but one one aspect of interrogation that seems to elicit many false confessions, uh, at least in comparison to other tactics, is that of false evidence ploys um, or FEPs. There are three main types of FEPs. The first is uh, what is known as a demeanor false evidence ploy in which an inter investigators tell suspects that how they are responding indicates that they are lying. They may say, say something like, you're not making much eye contact, you know that's a dead giveaway that you're lying, right? Or, I know you're lying by the way you're fidgeting in your chair, it's obvious. So they're just, they're they're mentioning how they are acting in the room and demonstrating that it's evidence of their guilt. 
Then tes testimonial false evidence ploys are related to things such as witnesses. If an officer says that someone saw them at the scene or if they say that they have video footage of the suspect somewhere, that is a testimonial false evidence ploy. The video is a little counterintuitive since video cameras can't provide testimony, but they relay that a person was somewhere at a particular time, much like an eyewitness would. Uh, testimonial false evidence ploys are one of the most common FEPs. Uh, this is partly because it is easier to lie to a suspect claiming that someone saw them than it is to say we have your fingerprint. Um, if they are the true criminal, they may know that, they're, that they wore gloves and that the investigators are lying to them about what they have as evidence, but they don't necessarily know if possibly someone saw them. Um, and then the, another false evidence ploy is that of the scientific FEP. They aren't as common, but they are the most deceptive. Uh, scientific false evidence ploys, as you have probably guessed by now, are ploys that involve some form of scientific evidence. Uh, the investigator may say something like, we have the DNA samples back from the crime scene, and sure enough, they match your DNA. So they're explicitly saying that some form of scientific evidence at the scene or related to the crime points to them uh, specifically. And as I said earlier, they may be the most deceptive and coercive uh, false evidence ploy. Uh, there's also bluffs, which can look a lot like any of these false evidence ploys, but they differ slightly. Bluffs are claims that police have obtained evidence, but they aren't sure that the evidence implicates the suspect yet. So this is useful for police if police aren't as sure as to aren't as sure about the suspect's guilt so if you tell the real perpetrator that they have a finger that they have fingerprint evidence and again the perpetrator the real perpetrator knows that they wore gloves then they may know that the police have nothing and that they can just walk away at this point um, police also use bluffs because courts see explicit false claims of evidence as more coercive but implicit claims or bluffs are seen as more constitutional. So you're less likely to run into problems in the court system if you don't use a explicit um, false evidence ploy. But courts, uh, although courts might discriminate between these ploys, jurors do not, as we'll see in the next slide. So the type of false evidence employed may increase one's chances of confessing and whether they internalize the confession or not. Uh, Perillo and Casson in 2010 used the alt-key paradigm to test the effect of false evidence ploys on participants. Um, so in the control condition, the confederate didn't see anything, and in the innocence control condition, uh, the confederate claimed that they saw the participant did not hit the alt-key. In the false evidence conditions, the confederate was stated to have said they witnessed the participant hit the alt key. Um, so that is the false evidence in this case. Um, and then in the bluff condition, the interrogator said the computer was connected to a server that recorded all keystrokes, but that the professor had the password so they couldn't check it right now. Um, in experiment one, they indicated that Bluffing increases false confessions comparable to the effect produced by the presentation of false evidence. Um, and then in experiment two, they replicated this bluff effect and provided self-reports indicating that innocent participants saw the bluff as a promise of future exoneration, which paradoxically made it easier to confess. So in this graph, what you, what you should take away from this is that in the... There's not much difference between uh, the bluff and the false evidence, just that they both produce false confessions, um, and but the bluff does increase false confession rates because the participant believes that there's some evidence that they're going to test, and so they can just, you know, plead out and leave, and then the evidence will come back and they will know that they're not actually guilty. Interestingly, when you use both, uh, the 
rate of internalization goes up, so these dark blue bars are internalization, and the light blue bars are just confess are false confessions. Um, but nevertheless, it seems as though false evidence ploys and bluffs don't really differ in their effect, and bluffs might actually be worse, and both produce false confessions. So in summary, over the many uh, slides of interrogation and false confession, false confessions may result from faulty interrogation techniques, um, ex and these might be exacerbated by individual characteristics. We also went over the three types of false confession that have been identified, and that is that of, of course, voluntary, coerced compliant, and coerced internalized. Um, but there might be a, be a better way to interrogate to reduce false confessions and keep the rate of guilty confessions up or perhaps even increase those, which I'll get into in the next section of the lecture.